And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Creator of a smor a smorgasbord of cr of crazy ass stuff that is mixing tabletop and vi and vidya, which some may call heresy, we call a blessed time. So Thank things you. Su things such as dust, star and city, um, strikeout, and the t and one of the big focuses for th for tonight, heaven or hell. The one and only <laughs> Joe. Jo Joel Rugendil, also known as Joel Happy Hill. Hello, thank you. Uh, I'm I'm very happy to be on here. Thanks for bringing this up. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming on and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way to my temple. So, ah, it was no problem. So, I'll start with the humble beginnings, in a sense. I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. All right, yeah. Um, when I like first went into high school, which I won't get into it, but isn't that long ago for some people. I'm pretty young for doing like uh, what I'm doing. I got into Critical Role, um, and I had no real intention of playing. D, D or tabletop games in general, but a person in one of my classes went on this whole like fucking tirade um, about Critical Role because he thought there was going to be like no one else who was listening to it, and eventually that led to uh, me and that person like getting together with some of our other friends and trying to get into the hobby. Mm -hmm. But and yeah. oh, go. Good. Now, oh, I was just gonna say, yeah. Um, that's basically what got me going, and through GMing those games, I got more and more into it. Mm -hmm. What I do find, in, what I do find interesting with that is obviously cr Critical Role is it lives and lives and dies in the in the space of what we call around here the world's most litigious fantasy game mm. whereas you, whereas the output that you've done is very much not in that particular realm so i'm guessing it didn't take long before you started venturing out outside of that outside of that bubble to see what else was out there kind of um originally my first project i like put out into the world advent dawn uh, was, like, just a big selection of homebrew content for d and um, The, like, setting and everything is something that me and my friends whipped up because we're not going to buy, like, uh, an adventure book or something for d and We did not have that kind of money. Hmm. And thought it would be fun to, you know, work on our own setting and stuff anyway. We liked fantasy. Um... But eventually, Avendon became its own game, as I just really liked uh, writing for games. I liked game design. Uh, and as I distanced myself from d and I tried other tabletop games and found that I liked them a lot more. Mm -hmm. I've, I, I've noticed that pattern over the years of, pe of people having a whole lot more fun with games and, de and designing them once they step out of that bubble. Mm -hmm. And I think I think a lot of it is due to the fact that with some with some ideas that some people want to do, you end up having to put a round peg in a square hole, or vice versa. Yeah. Um, I one of one of the big one of the big examples that that I always bring up whenever people do the whole, oh, you can run any kind of fantasy with D and D is, okay, fighters are expected to let to likely go with. Um, sword and board, or a or a great sword, but especially sword and board in some form or another. Sometimes it's not even a sword. <laughs> How are you going to do that in say 
in in say in say a Japan adjacent campaign setting where shields aren't really a thing, or in or if yeah. I can use Japan, how about India, or even or even parts of Africa? I think the the issue with that is always that um, I think a lot of D and D's design, at least for Five E, is like purposefully made generic like you can take so many things out of it and it still functions basically the same way at its core because like everything works kind of independently from each other in a weird way so you can always just argue like oh take this out add this in it's easy and it would it probably would actually be not that difficult but it doesn't mean like it, you're you're achieving the things that you want to do in that kind of game yeah about about that i do, i've n- even that, I, even that, I find suspect. the The idea of it being generic because it's a, because, well, when I th- when I think of generic games, stuff mm-hmm. that comes to mind is like Savage Worlds or GURPS or Hero System, or Amber yeah. Amber Di- or um that Amber Diceless Ac- Active Exploits, mm-hmm. or um or char or Charge. Basically, anything that would be in my Universalist folder, um. Mm-hmm. Even to even stuff like Burn Two D Six Bolts or um, Chimera. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I I I think it, the fiction of D anD D is not universal or like um that malleable. But I think the idea is just that like, or more so, I was trying to bring up is just that the mechanics are not super evocative of much most of the time. Kind of like. I, I feel like the reason why a lot of D&D alternatives are using the same fiction is because the mechanics can be done so much better to actually evoke the ideas you want to evoke with a fantasy game, you know. Well, once you once you step outside the bubble, you don't have to you don't have to deal with the shit or get off the pot regarding what sort of fantasy you are cuz Yeah. That was what I w- that was what I was trying to hint at when I when I brought up the um Japan example. Because mm. this the idea that it can the idea that you can use it to run any kind of fantasy really o- really only exists when your only when your only exposure to fantasy is just um Lord of the Lord of the Rings and all and all of its knockoffs or the or the the um Western Europe British Isles pastiche yeah which nothing wrong with that but that's not the whole of fantasy mm-hmm. um. And I'm I'm not I'm I'm not even going into say into say specific regions. The if you, I'll to use the, the big example that I always bring up is the way magic is treated. The mm-hmm. Vancian model, the spell charges and all that, which has been which has been a thing since day one, and is a successor to the to magic as artillery in the old chainmail books. Mm-hmm. Was made was inspired by the Dying Earth books by Jack Vance, which is far more sword and sorcery where magic is poorly understood. Problem is, magic is not poorly understood in a lot of the pseudo fiction that D and D tries to go with. The, mm-hmm. This is the problem when you don't have a setting. You just ha- you just have a bunch of bullet points. <laughs> yeah. It's. I feel like Wizards has really tried to push the idea of like the Forgotten Realms and like the Dungeons and Dragons settings as like something that isn't like derivative or anything. It's like oh, it's their own thing. But the the mechanics of the game don't reflect that. I think. Also, also forget. Also, there isn't there isn't anything to indicate Forgotten Realms as the default se- as the default setting within the book, and it tries to play it both ways. And yeah, my rule is if it ain't in the if it ain't in the core if it ain't in the core book, you can't say it's the core setting. Yeah. Except they haven't even put they haven't even put out a unlike in, unlike in previous years they haven't put out a full on setting book. They'll instead they'll instead half ass it with say focusing on the Sword Coast or something like that. But yeah, the the big one the big one to focus on on is this, if you're. The further outside of that high fantasy bubble you go, the harder the harder you have to work, and you probably ended up having this the same thing go, going going on yourself. That 
eventually it just feels like you're developing a, you're de you're developing a game in and of itself and with with the amount of house rules you're doing yeah exactly that's what happened with advent dawn oh uh, um would it be fair of me to say that some of the stuff that ha that happened with advent dawn migrated over to star and city or is advent dawn kind still, of. still a thing that's in that's in limbo that you never fully released uh yeah not really they are two very different projects however i am still kind of working on advent dawn it used to be available on my itch but eventually i took it down just because i didn't think it matched the quality i wanted to put forward with my other books mm -hmm. and now I i'm working on a sort of like soft reboot of it because it's still something that is like i am invested in and want to like see blossom in terms of like my readers and stuff yeah now with with at least with at least two of the pr projects that you have on that you have on your itch um there's a very clear video game influence and i'm get i'm guessing that was present from day one of of video games being part of your appendix n if you will yes definitely um i always wanted to do like game design stuff i loved like rpg maker and stuff and i always wanted to make video games in particular when i was younger um so like i only really have been involved in tabletop rpgs for the past few years mm -hmm. so i think my much longer time with video games shows in how i design my tabletop stuff yeah and i've s i've seen some in i've seen some interesting takes when it com when it comes to the relationship between video games and t and tabletop especially since mm -hmm. a lot of people kind of forget kind of forget that they're they have a much closer relationship than a lot of people believe because everybody just seems to have conveniently forgotten that TSR had made compu had made D&D computer games back yeah. in the day. Like does did any, did everyone just conveniently forget about the gold box games? <laughs> it's very frustrating to me sometimes. I I've I've seen that pop up like two times in particular recently and it's it's always just confused me. Mhm. Mm Hell, well, if I want to go even further, I could bring up the um, the D and D st um, software that was on the Plato engine back in the seventies, mm. which I only found out out about that because I was doing research on the origins of video game RPGs and trying to trying to demonstrate that extra credits was dead wrong when they claimed um, when they when they claimed the the um RP, the video game RPG scene in Japan was born from visual novels, mm. which I've art, I've covered that elsewhere. That anyone who claims that kind of thing is talking out of their ass, and also discrediting the like tabletop game scene in Japan. There is actually quite a like yeah um I've, large I've, scene there. I've been co I've been covering that. Oh. I remember in one form or another we. On the channel here, we did a deep dive into Convictor Drive, which some pe which a lot of people are referring to as Common Writer in RPG form. But that's but um, I have on word of God that that was one inspiration, but not the main one. Um, it takes a it takes just as much inspiration from Iron Man. Hmm. Um, Probably, probably the cartoon as well, because the armors within it, in their inactive state, are briefcases. <laughs> you know? Oh, fun! You know, like the brief, like the briefcase from the original cartoon. Yeah, that's super cool. I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know really anything about Converter Drive. I'm looking through your channel right now, and I do see those like uh, the 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 Convictor type yeah. uh, review stuff. Yeah. Um. So now, the thing that. But one one of the one of the really key things that I, that I ended up noticing that was amusing was when the Goblin Slayer TTRPG adaptation was was um, published in English by Yen Press. Mm. A lot of people were like, "Why didn't they use D and D for this?" I mean, there's that there's the reference to the to the D and D five E character sheet in the light novel. Mm. Well, the reason is quite simple: D and D doesn't have that much of a footprint in Japan. The game huh. that does have a bigger footprint 
in fact has the biggest footprint in Japan, is, as far as homegrown, um, Sword World, which is what Goblin Slayer was using as a base. It's a modified oh. version of Sword World, which um, there's been a group of madmen who have been taking their time to do fan translations of the Sword World books. They're, they started with the books for 2.0, and they're currently doing stuff for 2.5. Sword World is an interesting beast. That's the that is the best way for me to put it, and it is also it is also a case where you're probably going to end up multiclassing in it. It's almost expected that you will, because of how it works. Hmm. But and of course, a lot of a lot of TTRPGs in Japan use D sixes because they're going to be the easiest to get. Yes. With a cup with a couple of weird cases, Convictor Drive is using D10s because its creator wanted to challenge himself. And hmm. Nova the Acceleration, at least the version I, I have um, access to, uses playing cards. Which playing cards is one of those things that is significantly underrated when it comes to mechanics, I think. I love the idea of playing cards. I, I've I've been trying. I've tried multiple times to do something with that, but I haven't really done. I haven't finished anything yet. I think it's such an interesting idea. There's been there's been a handful of games that have done it. I just think that we haven't fully explored what you could do with it. Yes. And now what? Now un unfortunately, when I look at the when I look at itch, it doesn't. It doesn't tell, doesn't give me a release order of it of anybody's work. So I'm guessing Star. I'm guessing Star and City was. You mentioned Advent Dawn. Was Star and City the one that came after that? Um. Yes, I think it is Advent Dawn, Star and City, Dust. Hmm. As are the first three in that order. Ah. And since. Since Dust is do is doing the Souls like thing, and since one of my one of my old episodes of the podcast was us talking about the difficulties of doing Dark Souls in TTRPG form, because we were so because we because my co-host and I were so disgusted with the five E five E take, mm. not because it used five E, but because it did things that were creating problems it didn't need to have. Oh, that's a shame. Um. Chief among them was instead of you, you would think because the the video games have health and stamina that introducing a stamina or an action point system would be a natural bit of course. Mm -hmm. Instead, they combined both into poise, not poise on um, positioning, and wow. your act your actions your actions decre your actions are going to decrease it. So it is both your health and your stamina, which... Interesting, but I imagine that creates problems when you're going off of an existing system that doesn't do that. Yeah, it also it also means you're going to have people be way too conservative. Uh... But moreover, it felt like a case of trying to reinvent the wheel that, di that didn't need to be reinvented. Yeah. And if 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 the claim was it would make th it would make things too too fu too fudgy, uh, or not fudgy, um, too fit too fiddly, mm -hmm. then what? You're you're already breaking that when you ha when you already have um uh, when you already have the whole attunement thing when it comes to magic, so yeah. And all all that you're doing is ju is just adding an is just potentially adding an action point system. Uh huh. That's you can tr you can track that with beads and most virtual tabletops you can track that you can track that automatically with just just one add-on. I can see why they would make the decision, but it seems like hard to do right, and I imagine they didn't from the way you're describing it. They got roasted. Ooh, I heard about that when it was coming out, but I never actually read the the Dark Souls five E conversion thing. I would. Now the they, I can understand why they ended up doing it because they had done the board game for for Dark Souls, and, mm, yeah. and they did a good job at it. Steamforge is good is good at board games and doing miniatures. 
but apparently, they're, apparently, when it came to actually doing rules, they weren't all that good. Yeah. <laughs> but now, when it comes to when it comes to heaven or hell, um, mm -hmm. let let's get, I'm gonna get the obvious out of the way. Um, when what game in particular did you first get introduced to Guilty Gear? Because with a name like that, that's what people are gonna think of. I think the first one was Rev 2. Um, I never actually owned it, but there was this thing on PlayStation where it was kind of like um, Xbox Live, where you could, you had like a growing library of games that you could play for a, a subscription fee. It was garbage. You had to like stream them, and there was a bunch of input delay on everything, and they already had another subscription system. There's just so many problems. Yeah, PS, PS when Now, I... <laughs> which is dead. It's terrible. Yeah, it's dead and terrible. And when I tried that, um, the main thing I did was I invited a buddy over, and we just fucked with a bunch of different fighting games for a bit. Uh, and Rev 2 really, like, stuck with me. We didn't actually play it much, because neither of us knew what we were doing. But um, I tried that for a bit, and I was like, I want to I wanna play more fighting games things. And eventually... Um, I played a bunch of Dragon Ball Fighters and then got um, the rollback patch they released for Plus R, and then I played a bunch of Strive. I still play Strive. It's just, yeah. I I will I will ad I will admit that my introduction was X. <laughs> that's how that's how far Oof. back I go with Guilty Gear, but. It does. It does amuse me that so that so much of that franchise is a scavenger hunt for music nerds. <laughs> yes. Oh. Not just. Not just it. Obviously, ha obviously, heaven or hell. That's a um. That that's a gam That's a gamma ray song. There's justice having the finisher gamma ray. Um. Mm -hmm. Um, Ka um, Kai Kisk is named after Michael Kisk, the lead singer of Halloween. Um, yep, yep. Obviously, Axel Lowe is Axel, Axel Ro Rose. Yep. Um, the obviously with obviously with Soul Bad Guy, you um, Freddie Mercury's fir first um, first solo first solo album was called Mister Bad Guy. Mm -hmm. And well, Soul's real name is Fre is Frederick, so Freddy. <laughs> yep. Oh. Um, and I was going to space, so Freddie Mercury. Yeah. And <laughs> um, there was there's even even with the even even with some of the theme names. Um. Ob obviously, this is more this is more with some of the older ones than some of the newer ones. But that motif is st is still pr is still present in one form or another, and uh, um, holy orders lives rent free in my in my head and ha and has for twenty years. <laughs> oh, that's great! I think I used it for my having a whole YouTube video. But I am curious if you had re if you had um any previous experience whether whether reading or playing any of the other. Um, fighting game RPGs that have been out there, like like say, um, Fight by Divine Madness Press. I have um, I've played a good amount of Battlecon. I've played Exceed, mm -hmm. and I have read up on. Oh, I forget the name now, but I, I know someone who's really in. One other thing that isn't really worth mentioning, since I can't remember, but no, I actually haven't played a lot of, like, RPGs. Most of those are more, like, board games. I haven't, I haven't played Fight. Um, have, you dip, have you dipped into Yomi? Um, David Serlin's Yomi? Yeah. No, I have not. I know of its existence, because Yomi Hustle got copyrighted by David Serlin because of that. Um, and I know, um, Fantasy Strike, uh, yeah, his that's, fighting game. Which, Fantasy Strike you know, is, a, like, a card game based on it, right? Um. Or using the same characters. Same, same universe. Yomi, Puzzle Strike, and, um, I think there, I think there was one, 
there w and um there was one other there was one other whose name currently currently escapes me they're all in his fantasy strike universe mm -hmm. um and of course the fantasy strike video game itself which oddly enough i, th I think is a very good teaching tool for playing 2d fighters it is. It's it's very effective with that. There's there's a few reasons why I don't like it too much, but I will appreciate that it is like actually a very good tool and a very good game at like breaking down what is like core to fighting games and making it like simpler. Mm -hmm. Now, part part of the reason I wondered if you if you if you had background with fight is because of the Trinity setup you have with speed, fortitude, and power. Oh. Since, but but based on what you said, it seems that that was something that kind of got accidented into. Mm -hmm. Now, I definitely I think you outright said in the in the pitch or, or elsewhere that that um he heaven or hell is specifically designed to emulate what's been referred to as anime fighters, specifically mm -hmm. the two D ones, not the three D party fighters like say Ultimate Ninja Storm. Yes. And that that brings me to that brings me to a few things I was I was curious about. Um, one of them is in, is in your um, technique system mm -hmm. because you built you built it around archetypes, and I'm curious if in an earlier draft you had gone freeform, but you but you realized it had to be done through archetypes, or what what led you to go with um, archetypes? Um. The original, it actually used to be more based on archetypes than it is now. Um, in the original, my original idea for it was making a fighting game, like RPG or board game or whatever, mm -hmm. that, where you build a character in a similar way to Lancer. Because the thing that always frustrated me about um, like Battlecon and Exceed and the other like fighting game, there's also uh, React, which is a more recent one that is a fighting game inspired board game, mm -hmm. is that they all have pre-made characters and there's no character building. And I felt like in the tabletop setting is like the perfect time to introduce character building into a fighting game because you don't have to like do, you don't have to create assets and stuff and the balance is a lot more contained since you're working with like smaller variables and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I was really confused, like why ha have these games that I love that I, that I think do such a great job haven't do none of them have this uh, this system that I think would make it amazing. Uh, so it, from the beginning, I knew I wanted to make um, some sort of class or archetype system that you could like level into in the same way that you do with like Lancer licenses. Mm -hmm. And I did see, I did see that you've separated them into three tiers of difficulty. Is that more of, when it comes, is that more of a case of system mastery that's that's expected, or more of um, the kind of mechanics that you have to keep an eye out for when ta when taking that archetype? It depends on the one in the section. It could be either or. Um... But generally, I'll just scroll down to it so I can give a specific reference. Like, uh, two three-star difficulty archetypes are um, Martial Artist and Ranger. Mm -hmm. Ranger is actually, um, in terms of the knowledge of like how to play the normal game and like your fundamentals, is pretty simple. They actually have a lot like simpler and stronger tools than a lot of characters but they have to deal with the um, management of resources the most out of every out of uh, all of the archetypes. Mm -hmm. So it requires a bit of like familiarity to play like without like forgetting things or making it like a weird choice. Where a martial artist gives you access to double the techniques you would normally be able to have, which makes it just inherently more complicated to play through, despite actually having some of the most um theoretically simple techniques that you're given uh the basic idea of their character of having two stances makes them more difficult to play yeah and i suppose the other thing i find in that i find interesting is 
the is the use of a the use of a technique die, but one that but one that is not necessarily rolled in the in the way people would th people would think whenever you're using die in these kind of games. Yeah. So what um, what was the what led to that particular idea? It's sort of like a practical problem. Um, the thing was, I wanted to think of a way to generically be able to do concealed actions. Mm -hmm. In uh, Exceed and Battlecon, they use cards, which are good. Um, however, I don't want to create physical assets for my games because I don't have like the funding or anything to do that. And also, it creates a lot more steps. And if you're mixing like different decks, it, it just there, there's so many problems that come from that if you're doing a different sort of system. And then I was just trying to think of how do you do like concealed intents in like a physical tabletop setting outside of like tabletop sim or whatever, where you can like type into a chat box or whatever. There's a lot of ways to do it there. Um, I thought that the best option would be to use a dice since the game already includes dice, so I wouldn't be adding on to the like accessibility of it. If you are able to play the game without that f feature, you are able to play it with that feature. Um, and yeah, it just... Um, it ended up with some pretty nice results, I think. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the concept of hope, was that meant to be a catch-all for a lot of a lot of super resources that you see in a, in a lot of fighters? Kind of. Originally, there was two resources. There is hope and there is freedom, which is a Guilty Gear reference. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, um, uh, freedom was a resource that you did not spend and was built up through advantage states. Um, and hope was what you used for super. So originally there was like a super meter and then there was a sort of advantage resource I was brewing up that came from me realizing that uh, if I wanted to actually like create a game inspired by um, the more high-paced fighters that I like playing, I would need to introduce some sort of idea of like pressure or um, it, it like systematic advantage rather than just positioning and stuff. Mm -hmm. But now they're both with just one resource, so they kind of are both. It is both your supers and also your advantage. Yeah. Although, although I, I of course couldn't help but notice that in with the setup that you have here, you don't you you don't really have the cooldown um, issue issue that say Battlecon has, where ev every action pair is eight. Is on a two-round cooldown, including any resources mm -hmm. you use during anti, which definitely provides a, a neat little a neat little risk reward. But that also includes a lot of your more mo a lot of your more high mobility stuff. So it's one it's one of those two two minds of the situation. Whereas what you the way you have it, all of the all of, all all of the material is available right is available right out of the gate. It's it's just there's not as much material, but you have access to it at any given point. Yes. And in that regard, it may be for the best that you didn't use cards, because that would mean everybody would have a, have a hand of ten cards, and that's going to be a bit much. Yeah. There, there were a lot of practical issues to trying to use cards. Mm -hmm. The original idea, I think, before I started writing, was I wanted to use like a standard deck of cards, and it was like, oh, um, your archetypes were like had abilities like, oh, your queens give you movement when you use them and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was based around like building a like a cut down deck of cards. Like you'd only keep twenty out of a standard deck, and then those the properties of it were changed. But it just there's a lot of reasons why it didn't work out. Yeah. Of course, of course, you're still using the di you're still using the die. It's just you're using the die just when it just when it comes to attack, and in yes. in that regard, I could easily see someone equating the di equating the die result to frames, mm. 
and having a higher result, having a frame advantage. Yeah, it's um doesn't really work out that way. Uh, in most in most cases, the die value uh, that you like put on your technique is almost always irrelevant. Yeah, um, I'm more ref I'm more referring to the die for attributes. Oh yes, yes. Um, yeah, I, I think the especially speed is very much based around the idea of frames, as a lot of your resource generation is based around your speed. So it, it works out functionally that if you have a higher speed, you are more often at advantage. Yeah. And when it now of. When it comes to the when it, came, when it comes when it comes to specialties and ta and talents, yes, this is this is one I do appreciate the this being in there so that you unlike cert, unlike certain other games you have a means to personalize uh, characters, but I'm curious what the dividing line for you regarding. What would regarding what would qualify what would qualify as a specialty and what would qualify as a talent? Um, before actually they were a lot closer and had less different diff had there were less differences between them. Mm -hmm. Um, but in a recent play test, not super recent, I think it was like a month or two ago, um, I realized that I wanted to make them more separate and ended up having anything that. Um, only affected a one specific situation normally be put under a specialty where things that affected how you perceive your character at all times be uh, talents. Mm -hmm. A lot of the talents work out as sort of like general gimmicks to your character that both you and your opponent always have to be aware of. Where specialties can only be applied to one uh, technique, and even if it is important, you know, when it is hit, it, only, it is only affecting one situation. Mm -hmm. Now, I that's that is that is certainly that's certainly a good thing good thing to have because I've seen some cases where the dividing line is not is not quite there, quite there. Mm -hmm. and the reason that's important is because I I am of and you're probably in the same boat. Of wanting people to take this and hack it. <laughs> yes, uh, I have a few people who like doing homebrew of Heaven or Hell recently on the server, and I'm I'm, I'm super excited with it. I, I love the it, it is Heaven or Hell is the first time people have done uh, like homebrew for my games, and it's been very exciting. Well, it it's it's evoking something that is that is broad, so it's something that could be easily. Um, fooled around with in that sense mm -hmm. but <clears throat> I would like to I would, I would like to t I would like to take this opportunity to kind of put things to the test and I told you about this before we did this before we did this interview that I was going to dip into this because I yes. I did a similar thing earlier this week when I had Tyson on talking about legends never die and put and putting his concept to the test so, I'd like to go through. A f I'd like to go through a few, a few names in various fighting games, and see how you would adapt, to th adapt them into Heaven or Hell's system. Okay, I was a bit, uh, I was a bit confused on this before when he asked. I'm, I'm wondering. So now I realize you mean creating like a. Like some new content on the fly. Before I thought you might meant like creating them using um, the current content in the game. Um, just how just how you just how you would adapt these partic these particular characters into Heaven or Hell's um, kit. Okay, cool. Uh, I did this. I bring up Legends Never Die when it comes to this because that's attempting to emulate MOBAs. So I asked yes. him a, I asked him about a few characters in MOBAs and how how it would work for his setup. Thought it might be the case when he said the name. So, since you since you already kind of did this once with Ryu, let's go, let's go with let's go with a Street Fighter character for for the first one. Um, All right. How would you adapt, say, Vega? 
Vega, I think Vega is really uh, interesting in terms of how you would do uh, his character in Heaven or Hell. Specifically Street Fighter V Vega, because in V, his claw is more emphasized as like a stance. He can manually switch in and out of claw mode, and he has like some other advantages when he actually like doesn't have the claw, which is normally always like a disadvantage for him. Mm-hmm. But I think uh, using existing content, you could very easily make a Vega-type character with a combination of Martial Artist and Blade Sage. Blade Sage being built around having like longer-ranged moves that aren't that are meant to hit like at the tip of their range. They have a specific stance and stuff that uh, enables that, and they have a lot of like small step movement that allows them to like get the exact range they want. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, if you want to build this character, you wouldn't be able to use that stance as martial artist stance is what allows you to have two different move sets. But putting a lot of those like blade sage longer range moves on like the claw move set and then having a more generic loadout probably with some of like the stance switch but the stance switching things that you get from martial artists on the other dice mm-hmm. could make for a fun recreation the only thing i think i'd want to make like a full new move for if i wanted to perfectly recreate them is one of vega's dive kick supers um there isn't really a thing like that in heaven or hell unless you really want to like stretch the definition or like specialize it and like mix a bunch of stuff together Mm -hmm. but that sort of like dive to the backboard and and jump across the screen thing is i think would be really interesting to make in the game yeah i do and it's it's interesting that you mentioned stances because one of the other ones i was going to suggest was gen who Mm. Is, Kent, is one of the po- is one of the poster boys when it comes to stance dancing in Street Fighter. Yes, but to shift away from a speedy boy to a strong girl, um, mm. how would you handle Rainbow Mika? Rainbow, I, the she does the wrestling in Street Fighter. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. She's, okay. Uh, she is one giant Joshi reference. <laughs> That's great. Um. She does like she's kind of like a more strike focused grappler, right? She has grappling moves, of course, at mm-hmm. less, you know, how she looks and would imply. But I've seen her in like Brian F videos call in like assists and she's got like the microphone she can throw at you. She's got a lot of like weird moves. Mm-hmm. Um I always love thinking of like placeables and assists in Heaven or Hell because it's such a weird like system to cleanly recreate in a tabletop setting. Mm-hmm. So I imagine she'd be like Juggernaut Illusionist? Juggernaut being the classic grappler type character with the biggest damage unblockable and a stance that allows them to do even more damage if they're unblockables and a, a bunch of tools just get in there and and start running your offense uh yeah get a few levels of that get the anti-air command grab get the regular command grab but with illusionist you can set up a lot of interesting like markers on the field and do the the sort of like um space management you would get out of uh her assist v trigger and somewhat her like microphone thing i think it like slides across the ground right am i thinking of birdie yeah some <clears throat> something like that mm-hmm. um now i'd i for the next one that I, next one that i was going to throw to you i'd like to shift to one that I don't think I don't think gets I don't think gets enough attention in my opinion. It's got it's gotten a bit more okay. in recent years with it, with the reboot that came out in 2019. But um, are you familiar with with Samurai Showdown, also known as Samurai yes. Spirits? I've played a bit of Sam Show Two. Uh, I haven't played a ton, but I do know of it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, how would you handle Ukio? 
He is the... He's in blue, and he's like the sick samurai. Yeah. Right? He's coughing. He's got tuberculosis, I think, is, yeah, is he the does, lore. He has, he has tuberculosis, and his main thing is be, is being a... Is being a is being in the I, the Eido guy for the series. Mm, yes. Okay. I I'm looking up some gameplay on YouTube right now to get a better idea. Of course, I think uh, Blade Sage is relevant for any samurai showdown character. The idea of playing at like that sort of mid range and going for like heavy damage hits off of. Like the slightest mistake is very much what Blade Sage is all about. Mm -hmm. But to specifically call out the eye stuff, you could do some interesting stuff with that. Um, I think I actually used Ukyo as like a baseline for a Yugen thing I wanted to make. So I know he has like the the fruit that he throws, and then you can do a second input to slash it. Yeah, I think that is like the the thing I'd want to make most if I was gonna make if I was gonna like work on a dedicated like ukyo. Say I wanted to make another book that was like a bunch of Sam Show characters. I think that's what I'd want to really focus on. The idea of putting out a projectile that like doesn't really do anything, but you can use it as like a bait and switch of like, oh, am I going to use this next turn to use my like extension off of that, or am I going to do some other thing? Um, speaking of SNK ba based characters, um, i I've got a, I'm almost in, I'm almost pushed into into picking one from from King of Fighters. So mm. let's go with the guy who was the poster child for, who was the poster child for edginess for a few years. How would you oh. handle Iori Yagami? I think I actually have something perfect already. Iori is a like very quick more rushdown type, right? He's got the grounded fireball mm -hmm. and he's got um I know one of his supers is like a big ol' grab. I don't know if it's actually a command grab, but the animation is like holding you up in the air and he explodes you. Um, you could, of course, use some of the, the Shoto stuff that I showed off with the Ryu video of taking like one level and a bunch of different things to get some basic tools. But I think what fits really well for him is a mix of Bastard and Dancer. Mm -hmm. uh, Bastard is... A fan favorite. I think the name really wins people over because I think I've, every time someone's joined the server, they're like, "Oh, I love, I love Bastard. I, uh, I want to play Bastard." Um, and they're all about like block pressure and being able to directly damage an opponent's advantage and eventually like guard break them. Um, I use things like that to represent like overheads and like different mix-ups and stuff as. You don't actually have to like react with blocks, of course. It's a turn-based tabletop game, mm -hmm. but the uh, direct damaging of resources, I, I like to think of as like heavy pressure and like of wearing people down until you can get your hit in. Yeah, I that. Yeah, that sort of thing with the amazing movement you get from dancer could really work as that sort of like rushdown character. Mm -hmm. Now. Shifting into into um into a lot of the a lot of the stuff that comes out of Arxis, um, mm. there there was one there was one character in Bla in Blaze Blue who normally I would be a type of type of character who I sucked at, but because of how he worked, I didn't, and that was Hakuman. Oh yes, Hakuman. I. A big fan of Hawkman. I don't actually play. I play a bit of Blaze Blue. But I don't play a lot of Hawkman. Um, but I know some people who love him fight against him all the time. Yeah, he's he is the, he is the he is a pure counterattacker. Mm hmm. There used to be a specialty in the book that was like Shield Master. That was all about giving a bunch of advantage to your uh, defense techniques. I don't think it exists anymore. Just because it's like, um, oh, I just, looking at this, I just found the perfect thing. 
there is a talent in the book called Catch the Blade, um, which makes it so that everything you have is a counter. If you, uh, if when you reveal your dice at each other, you ha- picked the same number, you get to counter them, uh, no matter what they picked. Mm-hmm. So, of course, if you want to build Hawkman, you've got to do that. Uh, yeah. Now, that sort of thing, I think, would work really mm-hmm. well. Now, shifting into into something a little bit more horror related, oh. um, I do have my love for Darkstalkers, obviously. Oh, Darkstalkers um, is great. How would how would you handle Donovan? Donovan is is he the vampire hunter? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, he's got the huge sword, doesn't he? Yes. Okay. Let me. I gotta, I gotta look up like a Donovan trailer or something, because I have not played Darkstalkers. I do recognize him. I think he's got like psychic something. Yeah, okay. Yeah, he controls the sword with his mind. He control. He controls the sword with his mind, and he also has some um, elemental tricks. Okay. Okay. Um. I I imagine that he doesn't seem super like puppet focus. It seems like the the sword moves are more so like uh, just an independent move. But if you wanted to focus on that, um I love the idea of recreating puppet characters in this game. I'm working on like a second book with some more stuff in it. I I can't go into detail of course on exactly what's going on. Mm-hmm. But I've really tried to work in those ideas of moving around a, like, marker that is central to your character and interacting with it a bunch. And I think things like that and different, like, lingering, like, projectile moves could work really well for that. The elemental stuff, there actually is an elemental talent where you choose an element and you get, like, to do special things based on it. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, you could do a lot of stuff. Donovan seems like he's got a lot of different things thematically yeah uh, now since 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 we brought since the game is called heaven or hell I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up a a, a guilty year character in in that and I, I how would you handle not soul bad guy but or rather not the one that we're all familiar with but his but his older self, if you catch my drift, how would you Ooh, handle order? older order soul? Yeah, okay, okay. I love order soul. I didn't. I, I'm not very good at plus R, but I did play a lot of order soul and plus R just because I love the ideas of what he does. His like charge ups and his big like multi hit things that come from that. Mm-hmm. You have to include some sort of unique resource or, or token system if you want to do that. I think that's just like. That's a requirement. There's a lot of ways you could do that, but I think to make Order Soul, I'd probably just try to stack on a bunch of different amplifying effects, which are basically just moves that you can, like, EX, spend resources to get an enhanced effect, and try to build really far into that idea of generating your resources Mixing it to different archetypes yeah, and stuff. As far as how I do, as far as how I would do that resource, the appro- the approach that I have in mind is if you if you if you just spend an action charging, you get the instead of doing the whole levels thing, it's either you've got it or you don't. Yeah. Oh, um, if you you if you um if you have if you have it if you have it. Then that you spend that in order to in order to do ex versions of moves. Yeah. But you can. But there. But there is one shortcut that I would put in, and that is you can either spend your you can either spend your action do um generating this resource, or you generate it automatically if you don't have it when you do, when you do an action and, on uh, and on the attribute die you ro- you roll the max result. Ooh, that could be fun. Sort of crit effect, yeah. That's base. I would I would say I would say for I would say on a d6 you need a six, 
On a D8, you need a 7 or 8. On a D10, you need a 7 or higher. Okay. Because because uh, otherwise you'd have less and you'd less... You'd want to go for small dice so that you can get the, the effect more often. Yeah, but you go with small mm -hmm. dice, you'll, ha you'll end up having the chance of low priority. Yeah. So... So that that is that is how I would do do it. I know that in in plus R they have they have it where you have three levels of it. That mm -hmm. would be a bit too much for this. It'd be, be it'd be best to just have it as as one level. Probably yeah. Um. Uh, now, I don't have I don't have a specific and I don't have a specific um character for this, but I am curious how you would handle. A character who is who is primarily known for having super armor. Okay, yeah. Um, the easiest option is that you just pick all the armored moves because there is actually a armor tag, which basically just means um, if you get hit, you don't get your thing canceled out. Uh, they still get to you know resolve. They still take damage and everything, but you get to resolve your action. And. Juggernaut, of course, has a lot of that, a lot of ways to beta attacks with armor. Um, but there are also there's also the unbreakable specialty, which allows you to give armor to any technique. Mm -hmm. So with that, the um the like functional benefit of armor is effectively uh you get a you know cheat and rock paper scissors. Normally, um every option has one weakness, attacks lose to defense, defense loses to movement, movement loses to attacks. But using things like that, you can make it so that you kind of rig those rates into your favor. I don't think there's any way in the game right now to create a technique that has no weakness, um, but that is generally what you want to do with armor, I think, if you want to, like build an optimal armor-based character, and just go for sort of the the best odds you can on mixing up your opponent with your options, and force them to directly call out your options whenever you take them. Mm -hmm. So... So, I'd given all that, I would... I would... I'd like to shift into Marvel vs. Capcom, and how you would handle... Magneto, especially with that whole eight-way mobility that he's known for. Mm, yes, I have. I've been tempted so often to add aerial states into this game. Um, it, it as of right now, it is very functionally similar to Battlecon in the sense that you are just moving across a two D plane, and that is it. Mm -hmm. But I even tried writing up like a platform fighter variant of the game where it was like a two by two board with height and length. Um, but it just unfortunately doesn't work out. So, to represent, like, aerial stuff, I've done things like giving things movement and then conditional, like, invincibility. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's what leaping the specialty has right now. You close in distance, but if you're right next to them and you can't close in, you're instead invincible and cross them up. Uh, the idea of going over an attack with a jump. Yeah. Would you, ha would you have it instead that... If somebody's doing a Magneto like, put in some house rule that they can always create distance. That would be, yeah, I think the type of, if you want to, it, like, represent that extreme, like, micro mobility, the ability to not just, like, go across full screen, but to be constantly shifting your direction, it'll probably be something like, at the end of your turn, you can always, like, move one space back or one space forward. Mm -hmm. Um, that sort of, yeah, that sort of idea, especially the character. I would I would probably make like a unique move for them that's like turning on flight because that's what Magneto has. He has like a, a, a he has a fly and an unfly and stuff. Yeah. So something like that where you can do it and then probably with low commitment, uh, like go and do other things on that same turn if as long as long so long as you have the resources, um, which would really allow for some interesting movement stuff. I think. Yeah. Now. Out of curiosity, did you ever play Melty Blood? Yes, I play. I haven't played Lumina yet, but I played um, Actress again, the original Melty, a bit. Mm -hmm. So, I'm cur. I, I am curious how you would handle, um, CL. CL, she has the gun, right? That's the power the version. Gun. The the original version of her. She, ha she oh. has. Oh. 
um, swords. The, the knives. Or swords, yeah. Um, her whole thing is that, are the, are the swords a resource, I think? Some... She can, like, throw them around. Yeah. They, like, stick into the ground sometimes. Hmm. There actually is, now that I think about it, yeah. a perfect thing for a CL-type character. Um, it was actually originally based on, like, Katarina League. Um, but this sort of matches. There is a specialty you can put on attacks that allows you to, like, after you do it, put, like, a dagger marker in one of the spaces next to your opponent. Uh, and when you walk over it, you get to do a little bit of movement and you get a combo off of it. So you can do, like, these chains of, like, knife throws into, like, cross-up movement and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, which I think is, in theory, really cool, but no one's tried it yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, speak in, in the same vein with, um, when, when we're dealing, when we're dealing with Arxis adjacent stuff. Um, yeah. Did you, did, did you ever play any of DNF Duel? No, unfortunately. I had some friends who were really into it, but I haven't been able to try it. Because there, there were a few, there were a few entries that I, I, would I was cur- I was curious if I was curious how you would ha- how you would handle them. Mm-hmm. Um. And for fortunately, fortunately, we have we have all of the characters in a resource um through 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 the old Dust Loop wiki, which um yes um. I'm not sure if it was the same ki- with if it was the same for you, but Dust Loop was a go- has been a godsend for me when it comes to um, research. Yeah, weirdly, like weird, um, like it's a small world moment. I actually know the current Dust Loop manager, yeah, uh, Krakatoa. Yeah, not on like a very personal level, but I've met him a few times. Mm-hmm. So, how would you handle the Ranger who? Who styles himself as a as an old fashioned gunslinger? Yeah, um, I love how Ranger looks. Uh, I, the specifically the Ranger. I don't know if they're called Super Ultimates or something. The Awakening Super that Ranger has, I think, is a wonderful little thing. I'm I'm an, I'm an edgy little guy at heart, and like he dashes around. Um, there is. There is a archetype named Ranger, which is uh, less so inspired by this Ranger character, as it's heavily built around um, managing uh, like a bullet resource, mm-hmm. which ironically would mean I don't think you would make Ranger a Ranger. You might actually go into the more classic zoner archetype of he, Battle Witch, which is based around like traditional projectiles. Yeah, he pr- he pretty much is a. He's described as a mi- as a mid as a mid range set- setup guy because he's got he has his big advantage is is having is having his projectile game on on point with some very fast projectiles. On the mm-hmm. downside, he doesn't have very, very much of an air game, and he and his projectiles, while while they're fast, they're not they're not going to be punchy. I think the a really fun thing you could do with Ranger as a character. Because I really enjoy how they move around and how when they do combos they end up like closing in on you and doing like their slide kicks and their jump shots and stuff. Mm-hmm. So maybe you'd want to do something like take a bit of Battle Witch, take their main projectile, the Hexing Orb, and then like making it launch, put a specialty on it that gives it combo. Yeah. And go into some other archetypes, movement options like Dancer or Bastard or something, and like start combos at long range with it and close in for like a big ol' uh like more movement based combo before creating distance again. I think there's a lot of fun stuff you can do with that kind of yeah. character. Now, this is leaning full on into house ruling, but and and it's okay. kind of cheating because I'm bringing up something that's 3D instead of 2D. Uh-huh. But how would you handle the cuz I'm I'm a big fan of Dissidia. Mm, uh, both the, yeah. both the PSP games and um, NT, known in, known in Japan. Same, as actually. Uh, I bought the, the the Steam releases not too long ago of uh, three and four. Uh, three and three and four. Oh, I think oh, I played the first one oh, uh, on on Steam. And I don't think I got two. Um, are you are you talking about Final Fantasy or are you talking about the City? Because there's only been three Dissidia games. No, no. Uh, 
D I S G A E A. You're th you're thinking of Disgaea. Oh, I'm a, I'm a fool. Okay, yes, <laughs> Dis Disgaea is the 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 Final Fantasy like. It w is it the action one? It was a it was a fighter. It's yes. A and there. There were two interesting concepts that it had the e the e the way it handled its EX mode, which was basically its sup its um supers, and more importantly the t the the uh, way it handled HP and bra and brave attacks. Mm. Uh, the central idea the central idea is brave attacks don't do damage, but they st they steal a they steal a brave resource. HP attacks okay. have a bit more wind up, but they directly attack health. And you, could, if you, there is a sh there is a pool of brave that's right in the middle that you can grab if you completely deplete someone's brave, known, which is known as a brave break, and it mm. takes them a few seconds before they can get their brave back to its default state. Okay. Great. And you're just asking, like, how would that sort of thing convert? Yeah, how how obviously with something like this, you'd have to house rule it. But how would you house rule that kind of thing? I could I could see tweaking um, hope to work to work with it, but I'm cur I'm curious how you'd interpret it. Ironically, there actually is a very similar system with hope. Um, if someone ends around at zero hope, they actually do have a hope break where the opponent can take an unopposed action against them, normally starting a big combo. Um, the system is slightly different, because they, there is not like a shared hope resource that you are like, um, fighting over. Which could be a, like an interesting, like if you wanted to fully recreate uh, Dissidia uh, like, combat in the game, you could like add that in as a fun modification. But there are definitely bastard is itself is fully based around the draining of your opponent's hope and uh, the like breaking them and stuff. There's even specialties like Vorpal, which allow you to gain like a free use of super if you are able to break someone with uh, the specific technique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I knew that that one was going to be a stretch, but it's something it's something that I've want it's something that I've I've made some attempts to try and in to try and integrate it and. Exalted third edition tried to integrate it as well, just having people fight over initiative, and in my mm -hmm. opinion, um, in my opinion, didn't do as good a job. The only thing that I'd probably try and address that um, the Dissidia games didn't is is put putting a, is putting some sort putting some sort of cap on how much HP da HP damage you do because a common a common tactic was. To do brave attacks until you could get a until you had enough brave to get a one hit kill. Ooh. Uh, now, granted, that means that you have to you have to land a lot of attacks successfully, and you are still on a timer. Mm -hmm. Plus, there's the whole thing with the at in in the PSP games it had it had this EX core that would show that would show up, and ev everybody would race to grab it like they were playing Power Stone. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's the way you'd be able to use EX mode and EX burst, and for and which would significantly change uh, the playstyle of of characters, some more than others. Yeah. Um, NT didn't have it; it just had a just had a a couple skills slots for skills that could be equipped and an EX skill that was unique to each character. But they operated on cooldowns and were more utility than something outright offensive. Although, although the the although speaking of that, how would you ha how would you handle a character whose super is is tr is doing some sort of transformation? I have always tried to implement this in a few ways. I really uh, want to have some sort of like dragon install type move. Right now, there actually are a few effects like that. Um, the martial artist has divine body, um, and there's at least there's rage on the flagellant, which are all ultimates that uh, Dante's balefire treads. These are all ultimates that give you a effect until the end of the round. 
which is, you know, when you beat someone, you take a round. You need to win two rounds to win a full match. Mm -hmm. um, and they all give different bonuses that are you know relevant to them. The dancer gives you a unique token that generates a lot of value whenever you move. Uh, every every time you ep you leave a space, you get a uh, momentum, and you can use that on a big old finisher. Mm -hmm. Rage gives everything you have armored, um, but makes you lose hope or, or lose health instead of hope when you get uh, tr trigger uh, things that are unsafe. And uh, martial artist lets you, uh, yeah, every turn you can switch your stances in the middle of a in the middle of a turn after you reveal. So you can sort of option select different things that are like fitting to the situation during every turn, which makes you incredibly safe on most of your attacks. Mm -hmm. Especially if you coordinate your stances to do that specifically. Now, and I, I can certainly see that. And part of the reason I asked these kind of things is because I wanted to see how far the concept can be stretched. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I'm not alone in, tr in trying to do that kind of thing. But as a as a kind of as a kind of reversal of the of this i'd like i'd like to i'd like to go through the archetypes and what and um what characters either served as an inspiration or or characters you think provide a good xp of that of that um archetype sure, yeah so we'll start from we'll start from the the easiest to the hardest according to the difficulty um, list that you have. So first off is right. Bastard. Yeah. Bastard, I think, is specifically based originally on Yuki Turumi from Blaze Blue. Oh, um, oh yeah. Asshole. Yes. <laughs> I love Turumi. Uh, that is the character I play mainly in Blaze Blue, and Bastard was the first uh, archetype that I made. Mm -hmm. They've changed a bit over the course of the game. But uh, as always, they are based around getting in close with not great movement and going for really oppressive offense that can end in really easy breaks that result in big damage. Mm -hmm. um, Battle Witch. Battle Witch is... Uh, the original idea was just like, I want to create a long-range character. I want to create a zoner. Mm -hmm. But eventually they became more and more uh, inspired by not only uh, Hilda from... The uh, uni, mm -hmm. uh, underblood, blah 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 blah. blah. Under, They've got a really long name. In, under night in birth. No matter w no oh, matter yeah. what they add to it, that's what I keep calling it. Yeah, no, under night in birth. Uh, they have that sort of idea of a lot of different setup ranged options. Uh, not with as much like combo potential as Hilda does, unfortunately. And more recently, uh, starts with an M. The the archer lady from Grand Blue. Uh, I haven't played get her enough name. of Grand Blue, so I couldn't. So I couldn't say. She she's like kind of very standard projectile zoner with some interesting movement stuff mm -hmm. to combo into. Um, but specifically, the vicious spirit move was inspired by me watching Grand Blue footage and thinking that is the coolest zoner move. I, I want to implement that somehow. Mm -hmm. um, dancer. Dancer is kind of a mix of a lot of different things. They were sort of a concept first, inspirations second type character. I wanted to focus on on movement for one, and I was like, okay, what are good like fighting game characters that emphasize movement? And I got a lot of different things. Um, Bardock in Dragon Ball has his uh, infamous Lariat, which was the inspiration for dynamic entry. Um, a unsafe move that crosses the full screen and allows you to instantly go into close range for stuff. Mm -hmm. They have like a f essentially a vanish from Dragon Ball. They have flash step, and as well as a spot dodge that allows them to uh, move forward and a multi hitting uh, plus on block move that is inspired by Soros's ex rapid blows from Grand Blue. Mm -hmm. So kind of a menagerie of stuff. Yeah. Um. Juggernaut. Juggernaut is very, very Potemkin. Um, 
So not only in just the idea that it is a heavy grappler with with bad movement, but also the options they use to get past like long range characters. Their armored shoulder charge uh, is from Potemkin. Their super, the Heaven Buster, is an obvious reference to Heavenly Potemkin Buster. Uh, it's just a lot of Potemkin in there. Mm-hmm. So, moving into the two-star difficulty ones, Blade Sage. Yes. Blade Sage is a mix of a few things. It is Marth from Smash, as well as Johnny from Guilty Gear. They have the, uh, like, at the tip of, a, of an attack, you deal bonus damage effect that is inspired by Marth, as well as just, like, some very standard... They have a parry, which is inspired by Marth's counter. They have a just long-range standard move that could be from any number of sword characters Mm -hmm. as well as a um interesting like uh improved back dash Mm -hmm. and a sort of like eye stance slash move that you can cancel into movement and other options which is from johnny yep um ninja ninja is a i think mostly just chip from strive um they have a big invincible backdash, which isn't really from anyone specifically. It's more so to enable the idea of them playing from mid-screen and then going in. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have chips like cross-up, like full-screen slash and quick slash. They have a long-ranged command grab that is slower than most, which is inspired by his uh, leaf grab. Mm-hmm. Um, a projectile that is low commitment and can be canceled into other options. And a clone as their super. Um, Flagellant. Flagellant is, uh, definitely Berserker from DNF. Mm-hmm. Uh, they originally were more so focused around, like, healing and, uh, losing health and staying at exactly 10 HP to get a bunch of buffs. But now they are more so just, like, kind of an incredibly, like, ignorant, um, close-ranged brawler that pays for their really strong moves by losing health when they use them, which has, which is even more, um... Berserker than they were originally, even though that was the original inspiration. Mm-hmm. Uh, go, eh, going into the three-star difficulty ones, Ranger. Ranger is happy chaos. Uh, just completely happy chaos, pretty much. Um, I actually am working on a happy chaos script for the next in the lab, I think. Um, and I realize that even though it is originally based on that. They are actually missing more of the weird options. It is mostly just recreating the system of shots and reloads that he has access to in Strive. Mm -hmm. Um, Illusionist. Illusionist was originally the Hellcaller, which was a puppet character that was made before I I introduced the system of markers, which is an uh, an essential... A mechanic for any kind of space control. Mm-hmm. So they really awkward, it didn't work well, and eventually I replaced them with Illusionist, yep. which is more so based around Battlecon characters and how they usually create um, gimmicks and like how they handle space control in those games mm-hmm. than any like traditional fighting game character. Yep. And lastly, Martial Artist. Martial Artist is... Uh, was originally had like five different stances and they were based on I forget his name from Tekken. The guy with like fourteen stances. Um uh, Lee. Lee, yes. Lee Lee, Lee Lu Long, I think. No no Um No not not Lee Lei Long. Um, um yeah it it is Lee. That's the problem when you have the, when you have names with with two sim with two similar syllables, but um Yes. Lei Wu Long, Lei Lu Long. Who's, ba- who's basically Jackie Chan in all but name. Exactly. Um, originally he was based on that, but Martial Artist has changed recently to only have two stances, but have a much more fleshed out and powerful moveset with them, which makes them honestly more like a Mortal Kombat Deception character, where they had a a number of stances and were able to switch between them through specific, like, stance switching attacks. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, Deception, during the... Yeah. Um, before before the dark days, before the Nether Realm days. Oh yes. <laughs> yeah, ne- Nether Realm Studios has been my has been my whipping boy, especially the last few and en- the last few entries, and I'm including, um, 
I'm I'm including injustice with that. I've never enjoyed playing Nether Realm games, but I, for some reason I've been binging, um, like Mortal Kombat YouTube videos, so just like reviewing like the history of Mortal Kombat games and stuff. Um, somebody had once somebody had once said that Square Enix has been coasting on nostalgia for twenty years. When I think mm -hmm. of a company that's coasting on nostalgia, and I pointed this out in a stream not too long ago. I think of Netherrealm because they're coasting on nostalgia for Mortal Kombat 2. Yeah. And doing everything they can to ignore all the advances that were made in the um P in the PS2 era. Yeah. Because there's a because if there's, there's th the 3D Mortal Kombat's are actually really interesting, I feel, and they haven't really revisited that at all. No, in, f in fact, they seem to go out of their way to try and bury it. Yeah. And I've, it's that's been it's been my particular annoyance, especially especially since, I'd say the I'd say those games did the, did the most amount of work to flesh out to flesh out the world of Mortal Kombat compared to and compared to any anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, I know some might argue the um, nine, ten, and eleven, but the pro the problem that I have with those with all three of those is. A whole lot of convolution and a whole lot of and that and an insistence on that um, character swapping chapter approach that they did for how, for how the story is told. Yeah. It's the problem. The problem with doing that is you build you start building momentum with the story as you're seeing it, and then you're switching to somebody else. Mm -hmm. I and. Am I saying that? Am I saying that that it sh that instead we should do the typical arcade style story? Yeah, may maybe. I mean, Arxis has been doing that for years. But perhaps instead focus on a small on a smaller batch instead of trying to throw in everybody. Yeah, I really wish. Um, because even with Arxis, they have like their full extensive like cinematic story mode. But I I would really like people to revisit like the. The arcade modes have a bit more effort in them, you know, with the, with the little um, artist renditions and stuff in between fights, and learning some of the, I guess, like, less lore consequential, but, like, fun parts of each individual character. I think people invest themselves more into that than people, than developers might expect. I, th what I think would be more interest. I often I often hear that you don't that you don't need to do story in fighters. I disagree with that. I think I think there's there's a tremendous potential when it comes to when it comes to doing story in in fighters. Mm -hmm. But what but what I think sh what I think should be done instead instead with it is use that as an opportunity to vary up how a fight goes. Yeah. Now sometimes you can sometimes you can lean a little bit too far into this, looking right at you every SNK boss ever. <laughs> you, um, especially, my I especially ha I especially have a particular level of hatred for two for um two of them, Orochi and Geese. Mm. Seeing Geese triggers me. <laughs> <laughs> Guess gay bosses are bastards. All in all. Yeah, they're they're bastards, but Ge but Geese and Orochi are special hell. Um, Ooh. Much in the same reason that I that whoever decided Resurrection would be a good idea for Gil in Street Fighter Three, I want that person flogged. <laughs> you think you're done? Then he j then he decides to just go just revives himself with full health. No, it's real classic. <laughs> Class <laughs> classic. But dick move. Yeah. <laughs> now, with that with that in mind, what what can you tell me about the about the about future plans when it comes to heaven or hell? There's a lot of things I want to do. I definitely want to release more uh, like side books. Uh, I read an article recently that was like, "That's how you should be making your money as a creator. Like, make sure people can have your core content for free." Or at least as an indie creator, and try to like build a community that can have access to your stuff, even if they can't pay for it, mm -hmm. and then like gain money off of your supplementary content. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I I, I want to do that 
for like the profit reasons, of course, but also just because uh, people are getting really involved in Heaven or Hell, and I want to you know support the things that people are reading. My, a lot of my current ideas are just like themed um, extra content. I'm writing a book right now that's like right now just a, it's, uh, three more archetypes, and I'm thinking I want to put in some like fun alternate rules uh, and stuff themed around the theme of the book, which is the heaven of heaven or hell. It's like uh, angel characters and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to write boss rules or like solo play rules where. Um, I guess it would be like, like the story mode book or something. Uh, there is one, which would game. mostly, I think, would be by having like enemies roll their technique dice instead of using techniques. There is one, there is one game I th- I think you could crib some notes from regarding that, and mm. that is Musha Shogyo. Musha Shogyo. I will Google that. Um, I'm, it's either, it's either Shogyo or Sh- or Shugyo. I I can't recall. I can't recall which ver- which version of the spelling they used, and I will admit a bit of bias because its creator has been in my temple. Mm. But okay, it's sh- it's Shugyo. Okay, okay, and this is a, a RPG. Yeah. Oh, it. One that one that has a, f- a few a few unique motifs with within it. Okay. I'll pick up the the quick start I see they have on a uh, um, drive through RPG. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's some of the some of the stuff is is going to be trickier to get because it's an Italian game. Hmm. An Italian game that's translated into English, so you can so you can actually play it. But s- still, is this um is this by what is their name? Is this by Rooster, perchance? Rooster Rooster Emma? No. Okay, they made Fabio Ultima, and I know they are also an Italian T- TTRPG person. And I was like, "Oh, that would be no, funny." No, this was, was, was that. this was done by Luca De, Mar- De Marini. Mm, okay, okay. Uh, who's also done the Roman Punk game, um, Augusta Universalis? Mm. Okay, okay. But there's a few there's a few things I could I can see. I can see myself um, messing around with, especially, especially build, especially building a, um, like some some sort of campaign book built built around the built around um, hyper DBZ. If you ever tried that particular Mugen experiment, yes, I actually I love hyper DBZ, which makes you one of the few people I've interviewed who actually knows what the hell that is. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I played a ton of vegan games before uh, as someone who enjoyed playing games that had no money. Mm-hmm. Oh. I still have no money, but <laughs> now I've got the funny games to play. Yeah, I've when it came, I didn't put I didn't put too much stock into Mugen until I played a project called Babel Sword, oh. which could be best described as as um taking Mugen and turning it into um psychic force. Oh, okay. Basic, basically, someone decided to take to take Mugen and sh- and um throw bu- and throw bullet hell into it. Oh, that's interesting. Not in terms of a not in terms of a scrolling shooter, but in ter- in terms of having having that full range of movement and all the attacks being different projectiles. There's actually oh, what is it called? I've been playing. A game like that recently, Probably. Maiden and Spell. Uh, I've been, I've played a bit of. Um, there's also Senko no Ronde, which does a similar thing, just with, um, three, just with 3D instead of 2D graphics. Mm, okay. So there's stuff, there's stuff out there, and I know, I know that there's a, there's a few oddball entries that I'd like to see how far I can stretch this concept, but. With all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my show and enjoy the madness around here. No problem at all. Thanks for inviting me on. Yeah, and we'll 
We'll prob one of these days we'll probably do some sort of follow up that focuses specifically on one game's roster or one franchise's roster. Oh, I could do that, yeah. But that that's something for another that's something for another night. Um, mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Of course. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!